to MCCQC, where our focus is on loving God and loving one another. I extend the audacious, outrageous, and challenging love of God, Jesus, and Spirit to you today. Today we continue our journey in the Lenten season and our celebration of Black History Month. Last Sunday we took off on this Lenten journey with Pastor's Reflection telling about fast car faith. Today our readings and message direct us as to just what this journey requires from each of us, our calling faith. Please rise as you are able and body your spirit. And join me in our call to worship and opening song. Are you ready for this journey? We are. We are excited to follow Jesus. MCCQC 
60 continues to be the church, no matter what happens in the world. Praise God. If you're attending in person, please fill out the participation card that you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you, or ask an usher for a card and place it in the offering plate as it is passed later in our service. Online, please let us know of your participation through the comment section, and let us know your prayer requests also, and they will be read aloud during our prayer service later. It is important that we have your email, as this will assure us that you are kept up to date on things going on and also allow us to share our weekly prayers, events, and inspirational email with you. Jolene, announcement? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I finally have a date for you. <laughs> March 23rd, we will be having our chili cook-off at Peace Yay. Yay. Um, if you are making chili, it has to be there by 4 p.m. The chili cook-off will start uh, exactly at 5 o'clock. Um, if you want to help, please reach out to me, and I'm still in need of raffle baskets. Thank you. Tag along. Invite your friends, invite your family, invite coworkers. Lots of people like chili. There's a bunch of it. So invite, invite, invite. <laughs>
unique and not so very different at all from the next the one next to you as you feel comfortable you may choose to join hands as we pray fiery presence break through our masks of indifference and dance in our hearts with your beautiful flames of faith help us god to sing redemption songs of freedom one love one heart let us not close our ears to the sound of children crying let us remember the ways we have hurt all humankind in the names of our beliefs lord give us grace to gather our strength to be love warriors this is the time for us to get together and feel all right and so we give thanks and praise to you O lord god and we feel all right let love cover us like a blanket so the spirit can energize us to run the race with perseverance as it was in the beginning one love so it shall be in the end one heart so get together and feel all right one more thing master of creation keep us singing that one song of creation show us how to be angels with skin on them for all that we encounter and now, with a name or a brief phrase, for what else shall we pray? My mom, my grandma, Thank you, Creator. Thank you, Redeemer. Thank you, Spirit. Amen. Amen. Here are these verses from Romans chapter 4, select verses. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to their descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For the law brings wrath, but there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all those who share faith. Hoping against hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said. So numerous, shall be your, so numerous shall your descendants be. The trust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being, full, being fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Words written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in God that he raised Jesus from the dead for justification. Please rise, whether in body or spirit, as you are able. Hear this good news reading from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then Jesus began to teach that he must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Jesus said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and re began to rebuke Jesus. But by turning and looking at the disciples, Jesus re rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life with, will lose it, and those who lose their life may save, and for the sake of the gospel will save it. 
For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Please be seated. <coughs> I'm honored and excited to introduce to you this morning Aubrey Barnes, who is founder, artist at Rory Rhetoric, Good Advice Management, and speaks in local schools with the nonprofit Young Lions Roar Creative Art Workshops. He is the author of many published poems and is a great inspiration to many, but especially to our local Quad Cities Black youth. Welcome, Aubrey Barnes. I'd be remiss um, if I didn't mention how well the glasses on my face right now are definitely prescription and they're not to make me look any cooler than I believe to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've just been in the space of as recently as a, a creative and just kind of growing as a creative and really kind of learning about the creators before me, you know, the black creators. Um, I've been in the space of uh, really kind of meditating what it's like to be childlike, you know, like. And when we're, when we're, when we're ch children, you know, the childlike part of us, we like to dress up like the people um, that we aspire to be, you know, whether it be like Batman or Superman. When I was, uh, when I was eight, I dressed up as Goku from Dragon Ball Z, and it was pretty great. But, uh, <laughs> as an adult, I remind myself, like, uh, especially just in the space that I am, as, as being this person who's a creative and educator, that adopting that, uh, that, that childlikeness of, like, not being afraid to, like, mimic kind of the, the postures of people who look like me and just uh, having that be a ritual to like have those ancestors kind of like give me their wisdom and uh, energy. So like a lot of the people that I look up to um, as creatives, like from the Black Arts Movement that we're going to be talking about, they were, uh, they were, creative, they were uh, educators and, and very progressive people um, who uh, always had a, a, a very a peculiar stature about them, you know, so just being able for me to kind of like mimic what they look like, it, it's me kind of taking on the energy to uh, allow them to kind of speak through through me as well. And um, even this morning, the shoes I have on are actually my dad's shoes. I, I went, went by my parents' house this morning and said, hey, I can borrow your shoes real quick. <laughs> so uh, my parents are actually, um, they're both pastors in Rock Island, um, Illinois. So again, kind of like being able to wear the shoes that my father wears on a daily basis, weekly basis, when he is speaking to people, uh, <clears throat> his heart to people, um, it's kind of like my way of like standing in the same energy that my, my that my uh, father stands in. So uh, again, I, I thank God for allowing me to be part of the space and Rich for allowing me to be part of this too. I was just telling him before I chose uh, my role as an educator. Um, I finished my degree in educational studies about four or something years ago. Um, but before I got into that profession, I was actually going to school to be a church planner, you know, um, and even though I left that fold, I tell people that, like, that part of my foundation has always been a part of, like, who I am now. It just looks different as someone who's a, a creative and an educator. A lot of my, like, theology or, or a lot of my, my faith is shown through, like, my art, you know, as a poet, as a musician, and also as an educator. So uh, just being able to be in the space uh, with all y'all who really, uh, I want to thank y'all for providing a space so that just is felt like, that feels connected. You know, you guys definitely make it feel like a community, like just being here and just hearing the affirmations of love and hearing just kind of like y'all kind of like mention those who have been lost over the time and space and kind of really still honoring their names. Like it's all been, uh, it's all been felt, but like y'all make that community what it is. So I thank y'all for having that energy because it's definitely felt makes me feel part of a home, but. So uh, a little about me, like uh, like uh, Rich said, um, I do stuff as a, as an educator. Um, I teach fourth grade right now, uh, but this is gonna be like my final year, kind of like working as a school teacher, just realizing that my uh, gift kind of like lies outside of like the educational spaces that we make it, that we have made, and just educating through my uh, organization called Young Lions World, where I work with young students and really kind of invite them. I, I, I try to use the word invite more so over educating because like. There's nothing that I'm telling students that they don't, they don't already know. They know how, they know what metaphors are. They're in school, they know what rhyme is. But I'm inviting them to a space to like create their own stories and create their own narratives through poetry and all that. Um, and it, it's a blessing to be able to do that. I've been grateful to like be part of their lives in that. Um, outside of that, I do stuff as a poet as well. So um, this little, uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, today is just about the uh, Black Arts Movement. And um, being somebody who's an artist and educator, I have the perk peculiar gift of like making sense and not making sense at the same time. So uh, I hope that you are able to follow me. But um, what I want to do, 
was kind of bring up some of the verses that were just kind of talked about that kind of resonated with me and just kind of the story about the Black Arts Movement. So if I can share those uh, parts with you, that'd be great. And also share a poet, poem from one of the uh, positive ancestors named Amiri Baraka. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it is, was credited to him as righteousness. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. So if you're not familiar with uh, Amir Baraka, uh, I'm going to be talking about him a lot um, kind of just during this uh Kind of like a, this uh, presentation. Uh, he was a poet um, and an educator as well. One of a, a educator who uh, started a school called the Black Repertory Theater, which was a school that uh, allowed to, allowed kids to find their creativity, but in, in, in a very constructive way, like allowing their creativity to be the voice of like social issues that affected them personally, social issues that they saw affecting their uh, neighbors personally, and then social uh, issues that were affecting the world and just allowing art to be that conduit in which he kind of speaks about um, revolution and all that. But this is a poem that he wrote um, that I wanted to read. If you ever find yourself somewhere lost and surrounded by enemies who won't let you speak your own language, who destroy your statues and instruments, who ban your boom, boom by boom, whatever that may mean for you, then you are in trouble, deep trouble. They ban your own boom, 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 you in a deep, deep trouble. Probably take you several hundred years to get out. So as I said, uh, Amiri Baraka uh, was one of the forerunners of what was called the Black Arts Movement. And I feel like it's a movement that, um, that we don't hear a lot about when it comes to like black history or like black narratives that had a positive effect on like uh, culture altogether. But um, it, was a, it was a movement that followed right after the jazz poetry era and all that, which for Amiri Baraka was a, was a part of the Langston Hughes. And it was created uh, with the heart of uh, allowing arts, again, to kind of like be an educational piece that, uh, that inspires people to like learn about themselves and be more aware of themselves because we have that awareness of self an awareness of who you are and have that uh, purpose of knowing who you are, that allows you to be more of a, of a servant to the people around you, whether that be your neighbors, whether that be your family members, whether that be your friends and all that. So it was a very uh, important movement for uh, black creatives and it was one created by black creatives who were also educators, which is, uh, which is, very, uh, uh, is very important that I tell people, like the fact that they also had a spot in them that they were educators. Um, and I think the first question that comes to mind, like when you hear about like the, the black arts movement and kind of what it was and the fact that Amiri Baraka like started his own school, you would think that like it would be received in, a, in kind of like a, a good energy and would be supported by many. But um, back in the, in the 1960s in his time and space, it just wasn't the truth, you know? Even the fact that they had to create their own schools as opposed to like integrate their beliefs and like how they believe that students should be uh, Kind of catered to and how black, black community should cater to, they didn't believe that they could have that like comfortably in the, in the public school systems that they worked in under the laws that were kind of like what education is and kind of like the same, which are pretty much the same uh, educational laws and the same educational uh, systems that we still unfortunately kind of like uh, face. I tell people all the time that um, less than 1.5% of uh, educators in this day and age are black and male. And I know like as an educator, being somebody who's been an educator for 10 years, and when I say 10 years, um, when I say educator, that uh, that is a pretty, uh, I mean that in, a, in an inclusive way where um, I consider being a paraeducator an educator. I consider being a teaching uh, teacher's assistant an educator. I consider being a junior high teacher an uh, uh, educator. I don't really live in that world where like a degree makes you a teacher because uh, with my organization, I actually work with a lot of amazing teachers who have had a lot of amazing stories um, I don't know if you, uh, if you all follow uh, the page that I have uh, on uh, Facebook and Lions Warp, one of our educators, uh, he's one of my dear brothers, his name is DK, he's from Des Moines, but he just had a session with the uh, students and like he had them like clapping and like learning rhythm and kind of like listening to uh, the words that he was saying through uh, music. 
And um, this individual, his brother, uh, he has no degree in education, but he finds himself a lot more effective than kind of like the educators, educators that we see within the system because he just knows how to uh, present his art and share his art in a way that like kids understand. And for me, when I think about the, the, the problem with kind of like us not having black male educators within the public school systems, which like has been a constant conversation of like, how do we get more educators? How do we get more uh, people like in this space to be able to like serve? I definitely believe it's a part problem as well, but um, I, I think that we don't ask questions of if we really want like educators in the way that we that we say we do. And when I look at Mary Barack and what they were trying to accomplish through the arts, how they were creating these spaces for students to kind of learn about themselves through the arts, doing these positive things for students, uh, for them to have uh, the school that they created, uh, the, Black, the Black Repertory School of the Arts, the theater school, uh, which only lasted for about less than a year before it was shut down because um, a lot of their school uh, sessions were being investigated by FBI, uh, FBI affiliates, they would have people uh, within their classroom just listening to like how they were working with the students, listening to how they were like serving the student bodies. And even with all the positive work that they were doing and just giving this creativity to students, they were still met with like being shut down indefinitely because their mission just did it uh, parallel with the mission of the school system of education that we have created. And when you kind of look at uh, our day and now of like having the space where we have a system, and, and mind you, Systems are always going to exist. I don't think systems in, them, in and of themselves are bad. It's only bad depending on the hand who's crafting the system and the heart of that person who's crafting the system. We have a great system. You know, we have a healthcare system that's great, expensive, but it, at the heart of it, it's great. You know, we have a, a spaces that are really positive. But at the same time, we have spaces of uh, and systems that that don't work for the people in the way that they in the way that they should. And for me, um, being able to learn about these uh, these uh, forerunners before me who created these schools and all that always have them shut down and all that. Um, they could have been in a place where they never existed anymore, where, where these educational systems were like, okay, like we tried this, we tried a theater school and it was shut down. We tried this black art school and it shut down, but uh, in retrospect, what it actually did was make the movement all the more straight. Where one school was shut down, where Mary Rocket School was shut down, there was five schools that were started here in Chicago, here in Atlanta, here and other places down south, and it continued to spread regardless of uh, like what the uh, response to the system would be. Um, and actually, uh, this next, uh, this upcoming March fifth, um, I'm actually uh, ha I actually have a had this uh, opportunity to uh, work with Augustana College, with having a conversation um, with this poet and educator named Dr. Haki Matabuti, who's an amazing man. If you don't know who he is, definitely I, I definitely encourage you to look into him and, and his work as an individual as an artist and as a creative, but he was someone who worked alongside Amir Baraka, very older gentleman. He has about three schools that mirror what Amir Baraka did where he, uh, where they're uh, mainly in Chicago, where he uh, teaches students art, teaches students agriculture, teaches students like how to like care for the mental, how to care for themselves, how to care for their families. And the fact that that school still exists to this point um, is inspiring, especially for me being someone who started an organization based on education that kind of like looks different from like what we've been given. You know, being able to see somebody else do it is a is, is kind of like an inspiring thing. But also, it, it holds a little bit of uh, this uh, kind of like disheartening as well, knowing that like schools like this, like uh, I don't think we think about it as much, uh, as much as we do. But like these people who we have uh, that we look up to as forerunners, whether it be like Martin Luther King, whether it be like Fred Hamptons, if you know who that is, Chairman Fred Hampton, mind you. Um, I was told that that by his uh, by his son that um, he should always be addressed as Chairman Fred Hampton. But if we think about uh, figures as that, they're like Malcolm X. These were great figures and did a lot in the world and made their name known. But I don't think it calls them account of like how much they had to struggle as humans. You know, Martin Luther King, like he he probably made the same amount as um, as someone who uh, was on a teacher salary, maybe even more or less. He didn't leave, he didn't live in the the biggest houses. He didn't have like nice little cars, he didn't have the uh, resources that he always needed, but he operated in what he needed to do regardless of what he had, you know, and being able to kind of juxtapose that to now and knowing that like these schools, these black schools still exist and still are doing great things for uh, students who don't feel seen, students who don't feel connections because they don't see people who look like them in the school systems. Because again, like when you don't have that black male uh, uh, counterpart within the schools, 
Um, I think it's just by I think it's just by familiarity you have black students who kind of feel as if they don't belong as much because they don't see people in front of them that look uh, look like them and all that and that's just a kind of byproduct of that. But like knowing that these people had schools like that and created that first students kind of feel more a part of the space that we call education and doing great things. Knowing that they still struggle and still kind of like had to. Uh, go through all these hardships through a majority of their lives, you know, it's a very disheartening thing, but I think that all the more kind of like speaks to how us as individuals can advocate for, for education um, that is that's creative, that is that, that creates critical thinking, that allows students to find their expression of, uh, of themselves. And when you find the expression of yourself, um, it allows you to be a more, uh, more better advocate of yourself and of the people around you and um, of the people that you may be in front of uh, in the future. So um, I kind of want to give a couple of testimonies, honestly, just with my program, Young Lives Roar, the things that I've noticed just in the last two years of doing this program. And I kind of want to give, a, I guess, a genesis of having this program as well. Um, I first started this program just out of the heart of just being someone who, like, alongside going to school for education, I was always teaching poetry freelance in different schools and different countries and that. And I got to a place where after I got my degree and had my first teaching job, I only lasted about four months until like I was just burnt out by all the like, by, by just the, the daunting uh, responsibilities that were given to me as an educator, coupled by just the, uh, the, the racist uh, situations that I had to deal with as an educator, you know, just being pulled from my classroom to, to my floors while someone else is watching my classroom, or just uh, being able, or just kind of like being uh, expected to uh, be okay with uh, students making racist remarks to me as well as teachers. Like for me, I just realized as a person that if, um, if my emotional and mental state isn't good within the space, I'm no service to nobody. You know, like I can't be a service to my students. I can't be a service to the people around me. I can't be a service to myself. So I left that space to create this program. And just out of faith, I just did it. Just really, just kind of like say, to say to myself, like I don't know where money's gonna come from. I don't know where, uh, uh, security is going to come from, but I don't care. I just know that I need to do this. You know, I just know that I need to make this um, a part of my narrative. And with that, the universe, God, whatever you will, kind of was like, well, has been faithful in that journey where I've had people kind of help me in the uh, in the spaces that I need needed without me having to say a word. You know, and I'm just getting, just being able to have the help was uh, was very. I've been very grateful for. But um, two years later, being able to work with like multiple schools within uh within the Quad Cities, you know, whether it be in Rock Island, Davenport. Cambridge, uh, Clinton as well. I've been able to see like what giving art to students does. Um, I was actually having this uh, workshop not too long ago, um, earlier this week, um, last week um, at Rock Island High School. And I was talking about the black arts movement with the students. And I was talking about the jazz poetry era and just even the, uh, the current state of music and how um, it kind of allows us as, uh, as black, how it allows them as black students to like have the concept of confidence to, protect, uh, to advocate for themselves. And one of the students was uh, saying, they said something that was really profound, but they said that um, they believe that art is one of the best conduits in really finding themselves and really allowing themselves to like really uh, find their purpose outside of the, uh, outside of the barriers that are made for them. And for me, uh, it, was, it was great to hear this from a student and really kind of seeing that in action with my students. Um, I've been uh, grateful to have students now who, um, who I'm uh, mentoring closely to uh, become advocates for themselves. Um, a couple of my students were actually, I'm actually uh, I've been actually prepping a couple of them, a couple of them to write poems uh, for a school board meeting that they're going to attend um, this next week right across the bridge. Because I was telling uh, these students that like their art transcends just being entertaining. You know, when you think about those in the black arts movement, like their art was very entertaining and very creative because I think that's just a part of art. But at the sort, at, at the at the source of it, at the root of it. Art is a way where you express yourself, express ideas that may be uncomfortable to people, may be, uh, may be uh, even seemingly offensive to people, but that's okay, because where what I'm always telling my students uh, is that where you create art that provokes thought, you're gonna provoke conversation some way. So I'm kind of like working with them now to be able to have them practice their voice and share their, um, their, their, uh, their feedback of what they see in the schools, uh, how the schools can be better, because they're the ones in the schools, like those people in the school board meetings, like. They're not in the schools as much as you. They're not in the desk eight to five, eight a.m. to five p.m. Um, and experiencing the same things that you are. So, like, for for you to kind of share your art and allow them to kind of like hear about what's going on, you guys are becoming better advocates for yourself and allowing them to bring you into the conversation where they're making decisions about you. And for me, that's the powerful part of like what art does. It's not just about entertainment. It's not just about um, a 
feeling, which those things come with it. You know, we have a moment here who's an amazing artist, I, and I, I definitely believe just from doing past work with her, that her, her drumming and the energy she puts into it, it is entertaining, it brings creativity, but just knowing the heart of creative, she's drumming out of like the recognition of the ancestors, or out of the recognition of those who came before us, just out of the things that we have uh, have, 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 have gone through as, as, a, as a black community and using the drums for that reason. So I always tell my students that like your art transcends, uh, transcends uh, entertainment and that it can provoke thought in the most profound ways, whether it's through words, whether it's through sound. It can always provoke uh, the greatest thought and the greatest change, the greatest waves. So just knowing about the black arts movement and kind of juxtaposing that to our present moment, like the question comes uh, like, what can we do now, you know? And, 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 and I like how uh, the service was kind of like started in the sense of like that uh, we don't forget our identity, but we don't allow it to kind of like create these barriers between us. You know, like Fred Hampton, who I brought up earlier, um, he's someone who I definitely look up a lot to uh, in the sense that like he worked with all peoples of all uh, all colors and ethnicities. He actually was the uh, one who created the Rainbow Co Coalition, which brought together uh, young lords uh, and all these uh, young patriots and people who are part of the LGBTQ+, and he brought them together to be able to say, like, we need to work together, and, and even though we have these differences, like, unless we're, we're not gonna move forward unless we're in the same agreement and we're in the same alignment of, like, what we need to do. So um, the question that, that we have today, like I said, is uh, what we can do to kind of, like, have these spaces and have these uh, narratives that those before us created in the Black Arts Movement, and how we can kind of, like, make us flourish. Um, the best thing that we can do, honestly, um, is uh, continue to uh, like continue to advocate for our students when it comes to like really putting them in and really putting it, uh, intentional edu uh, educational uh, efforts in front of them, and allowing them to be creative. Uh, one thing that I've learned in the last two years working with my students is that like they know way more than we give them credit for. You know, but when we give them that space to just talk and just express what's going on in their minds, their hearts, and just hear their conversations without trying to like really kind of like be in the middle of that or try to like kind of like change the conversation, like really learn how much they know. And that gives all the more inspiration to know how to kind of move and how you can support them, especially like through the arts, whatever that may be. I took them like, there's just talking, the, the act of talking is art. What I'm doing right now is an art, you know, that in and of itself is an art, but we're able to uh, channel certain art forms, teach students how to like advocate for themselves, better into the world, become better leaders for themselves. I believe that's what kind of makes our world better, but it, it doesn't happen like in our own silos. It doesn't happen individually. Like being somebody who 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 who, who believes in being independent and all that, I believe I, I I know for sure that like there's always a I have a roof over me, you know, by myself. But when I'm working with my neighbor and allowing us to have these conversations and holding ourselves accountable to doing what we can for uh for the students, for for our communities, that's where real change comes from and all that. So uh, I thank y'all again for, for allowing me to be a part of this and sharing a little bit on the Black Arts Movement. I hope it was inspiring, I hope it uh, provoked thought, and I hope it also provoked conversation as well. And again, Rich, thank you for allowing me to kind of share my heart and what I do as well. I thank y'all again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Just good to sit here. Yes. Yeah. All right. Come on, sit
seen it. Today, as we prepare to go to table, you are being asked about your own calling. What does your faith call you to do? We've heard about Augur's calling, working with the kids, being creative. That's an awesome calling. But everyone has a calling. Some of them are, are very simple. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be what you do for a living. Either. We all have a calling. Think about what God is calling you to do. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord God, we breathe in your Holy Spirit. We breathe out all that we do not need, all that would keep us down. We breathe out, God, all that separates us from loving you, loving creation, and loving one another. Holy One, gather us in the Spirit's time as together we pray in the manner Jesus taught his own disciples to pray. <coughs> Our Creator, in heaven and all around us. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom. The power and the glory. Hear now the good news of Jesus the Christ. God meets you exactly where you are. It doesn't matter where you've been, where you find yourself right now, where you think you might be headed. Our God is a God of love and forgiveness who runs to meet you with open arms. In the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our God is an amazing creator. Jesus was extremely creative in the way that Jesus presented his teachings. It wasn't the same old thing. And so we remember. We remember the night that Jesus blessed the bread, broke it, and offered it to his friends, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Likewise, after supper, Jesus lifted the cup, blessed it, gave thanks, and offered it to his friends, saying, This is my love, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. Holy One, we ask your blessings on these simple elements of fruit of the field and the fruit of the vine. In the many ways in which we celebrate and understand them in our diversity, or fail to understand them at all, may they be soul food for our spiritual journeys. In the name of Jesus, the joy giver, we pray. Amen. Amen. This is an open table. You need not be a member of this church or any church to receive what God has to offer you here today. Our first and helpers, we come forward.
homes. And we ask your blessings not only upon this, but upon all that is yet to come. In the name of Jesus, the joy giver. Amen. Please rise, but it's not in your spirit as you are here. I forgot to put this one in. But you guys know it well enough. You said, no, my life is in you. Thank you. 